the Cyber Eye Machine Learning Project. So for context, this is an extension of our Cyber Eye CISO dashboard project, uh, which for those who um, aren't sure or need a bit of a refresher was our project to develop a CISO dashboard via Elastic that gives a 360 view of the security posture of the organization. So in terms of the Cyber Eye Machine Learning Project, so our problem statement for this project was that the catalog of metrics on the CISO um, dashboard um, requires a lot of manual analysis and specialised knowledge to be able to put together all of these metrics and assess the security posture of the organisation, which is a manual process and it does require time and effort and adding complexity to the decision making process, which can potentially delay um, identif identification of emerging risks. So the Cyber Eye Machine Learning offering aims to leverage machine learning capabilities to create an AI chatbot feature within the existing uh, Cyber Eye Elastic dashboard um, that can automate this analysis of the metrics and provide C-level executives with custom sum summaries and detailed responses regarding the specific Cyber Eye metrics that can then streamline and enhance the decision-making process. Uh, next slide, please, May. So this is just the overall project roadmap for our Cyber Eye Machine Learning project. Um, just wanted to highlight, so we have had a May for a six week period, which ends today. So we've been focusing on the first two phases here, which is our text to SQL model and experimentation and performance evaluation and the model selection and further exploration. So we've gone through three sprints within the six week period, um, which has led us to the findings we are gonna to present to you today. I'll then hand off to Darcy for the next slide. Cool. Uh, so I'll quickly try to set a bit more context and then I may get into the guts of it. The, there is a difference between the internship and the project. The internship is just this six week uh, period where we want to get to some level of uh, an output that is of value to skill field and of, of value to a main. And the project is something that is more long term that aims to fulfill business um, value output that will ideally be part of CyberEye. So as Maddie mentioned, this was a data science internship. So we we're focusing on the data science work of an overall capability that the problem that would fulfill the problem statement that Maddie mentioned, which is how do I interact with my data with natural language? So part of that system would be some sort of model or digit models. And that's what we were looking at. And I may I'll talk about a bit more. And the outputs are around having a review of the state of the art of text SQL, how other products are interacting with their data through chatbots, document our experiment results, assess feasibility of the pattern we looked at, and have some reusable code and model issues if we do continue on with that. And then we'd also have a selection of models that we'd like to use, options for the ML system we would eventually build in the CyberEye ML project. And then also a demo of the proof of concept capability. And obviously we a presentation on our results and learnings throughout the, the uh, project. And one other thing is Amaze only been here two days a week for six weeks. So it was a relatively short amount of time. And also I think I've thrown quite a difficult challenge to him and he's done really well in taking it on, especially with very little kind of and holding and getting stuck into the technology and assessing things and talking to the right people. So he's done really well. And we're now gonna go into what we did do over the six weeks. So next slide, mate. Uh, just some starting knowledge on the reason we went in the direction at the start that I kind of chose to look at, which was first one, cyber right data is in Elastic Server. Their text to Kibana query language can be done in GPT-4, but we didn't want to send actual data to OpenAI due to <coughs> privacy. And also that quality is not really benchmarked in academia. It's very, uh, it kind of works, but a few blogs say it's not amazing. Text to SQL is a popular subcategory of large language models that convert natural language to SQL queries. It has a large community. There's lots of open source models. You can download them or you can use um, open endpoints and you only have to send schema and a question instead of actual data. And Elastic had a SQL API endpoint, which I didn't know much about, but I knew it existed. So I thought text to SQL, Elastic SQL endpoint. And for big models, if we do need to test them in our own uh, secure environment, we have a Databricks machine learning experiment environment in Azure that we can use if we need. 
And also text to sql is the underlying technology behind lots of emerging products, understanding how it works, its limitations, and different ways to get the best out of it is valuable to skill field as consultants anyway. So with that, we went on and looked to implement something like this on CyberEye, and that's where I'll hand it over to Amay mm -hmm. to show us what he's got. Thank you, Darcy, for the kind word. Um, so when we, when we think of the text to sql ecosystem, there are numerous products available in the market. Um, Databricks has Lakehouse, uh, Snowflake has Cortex, and Vizo has its own um, uh, text to um, text to SQL elastic endpoint. But the but the main contention is that most of these models they aren't as they aren't up to par. And for the average person who does not have any a lot of technical ability to be able to interface with a uh, cyber with a elastic um, database, it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of effort to be able to generate a query just by um, memory. So that's why we want a model that turns natural language into queries that gives us a understanding of how the data works. So there's an SQL, there's a text to SQL model, and the user asks a question on the app interface. And the question it goes in as a NLP context to the text to SQL model, which sends it back as a query to the app interface. And this app interface sends the query to the server database, which encodes the data in a um, metadata um, container. And this question is goes to the metadata container, which returns all the relevant indexes and JSON format uh, files. And then in another LLM takes the SQL query results and outputs back the summary in the app interface, and that gives the user the answer that they're looking for. So for this project, I, we went through a bunch of different steps. For business understanding and research, we um, understood exactly the problem statement that CyberEye is solving, and also try, try to understand how, um, what we try to understand what the available models are in the market, what they achieve, what the accuracies are, and how they, um, how they achieve what they achieve. And for data profiling, we chose um, a select level of in, in, um, indexes on CyberEye to be able to query on. And for index selection, we extracted all the information from the indexes and placed them in a local SQL-like database on which we can test the SQL um, text to SQL queries on. And we assess the models and their ability to be able to generate valid queries that are actually capable of uh, querying the indexes. And then we tune the models with uh, by tinkering with the parameters. Um, the parameters are uh, just features of a model that you can tinker with to either enhance or um, augment the functionality of the model for its use case. And then we had a retrospective on the results and what we learned about the kinds of questions we can ask a SQL model, uh, a, a text to SQL model, and how we can retrieve better results from it. So the first step was the data profiling. We mainly chose only two indexes, the cyber CSV metrics and the risk scores default. Uh, cyber CSV metrics is fairly small in its uh, field count, but it um, spans a large variety of um, different um, metrics, which is why, and it's also one of the main underlying indexes in the CyberEye database. So that's why it's a good um, index to choose to be able to test the queries on. And risk scores default is a much more quantitative uh, index, which um, gives really numerical answers, which helps us uh, assess the risks and um, assess the future of cyber. So the approach for our um, project was we first used the Python and Elasticsearch API to retrieve data from cyber for our specific indexes. And we turned the NLP into an SQL um, query. So right here, we can see that there's a, a question. Can you give an overview of the security training completion rates across the organization? And this goes into um, this, along with the index and the table and the fields for CyberEye, go into the number station text to SQL model, which translates this question into a query, which is select some CSV data training completed from the CyberEye CSV metrics 
and this goes straight into the elastic and uh, I mean the cyber database and through similarity search it retrieves all the number of trainings that we have and once he, once it receives the um, number it outputs the value in a by putting it through a um, large language model and use a text output so this we aim to automate the querying process and also allow for a adaptable user interface, which is fairly intuitive for anyone to understand and use. So as I mentioned before, there's in the text to SQL ecosystem, there are numerous different models. And um, the one main model that is winning is Llama. So SQL Coder, all the open source um, good performing text to SQL models are based off Llama. SQL Coder is based off Llama. Um, and all the other, all the three main um, models that we tested that were open source, number station, SQL, and also data ease, they're all based on uh, Facebook's Llama model, which is a large language model that was fine-tuned on a on at least 70 billion parameters of um, data. And people have been able to fine-tune it to use it for text to SQL purposes. And the figure here is sort of misleading because although it shows that SQL Coder has a 90% accuracy rate, the Results here are mainly because of uh, the questions that were asked were fairly easy, mm -hmm. and not um, and the context window did not have a large uh, table with numerous different fields like we did. So for our use case, we found the model that works best was not and was none of the ones that are in this uh, figure right here. And for and the main obstacle in achieving an accuracy rate in SQL queries is the training schemas that we parse into as a context into the model, the RAM and processing power, because large models like the 70 billion parameter alpha one, they require a large amount of uh, RAM and GPU strength to be able to run. The context length um, also matters because if we want to input a large um, database schema to um, find queries for, it can become a problem, but also parametric configurations, these are the ones that um, the parameters for a model are just the features that we can edit to improve or augment the um, loading of the model and also the functionality. So this was the batch one testing where we just um, parsed in the parsed in, um, text to SQL model and tested its tested in its ability to just generate SQL output. And this was tested on its syntactic accuracy. So most of these models, they uh, functioned well. So T5 is from Google. It's a large, it's a open source large language model, and um, NSQL is Number Station, and this is a 350 million parameter model. And this was fairly good, at least 60 percent accurate in its SQL uh, syntactic accuracy. And in our batch two testing, we tested these models on a dummy CyberEye database with only a few data points that we had pulled from CyberEye. So batch three was where we finalized the three models that we'll use. So those were SQL coder, data ease, and uh, number station. So as you can see, the number of tests run across them um, lowers because most of the parametric um, um, tweaking and uh, configuration was done on SQL coder. I ran, we ran at least 14 tests on SQL coder and just tinkered with the parameters to see which one works best. So that's why all the subsequent models that we used, we needed fewer and fewer um, tests to figure out which par parametric configuration works best. So the number station model, in the end, we just need three um, tests to to, uh, to find out which uh, to find a, a to find an output that actually allows for good query execution. So the more parameters a model has, so for like a large language model like a llama, it needs more. Um, there's more customizations that you can do within the um, loading of the model to affect the outcome. So one of the parameters that I found a that we found a good trend across was um, temperature. So temperature um, and the temperature parameter in a model um, enables the randomness. So the higher the temperature is, the more random the output is. So as you can see across the 30 tests that we performed, um, when the temperature is close to 0 0.45, the correctness of the data is the best. So around, um, and this was the um, parametric configuration that worked the best. So across um, all the 26 text tests that we did, 
this parametric configuration was the one that worked the best. So of course it's 0 0.5 and it's um, a temperature setting, but it was still one of the best because also the amount of max tokens that you can uh, that can produce also affected the accuracy in output. So these were our findings. Um, when we tested across all of them, surprisingly the SQL coder send building parameter that which said it's close to 90% accurate was one of the least accurate if when you account for the amount of tests done on it. And the data ease model was a little bit better, but the number station uh, 7 billion parameter model was the standard model because most of it's, uh, most of the questions we asked resulted in valid queries that were, were able to execute and retrieve output. And we tested this um, across, we only performed three tests in number station and it was still giving us a large amount of valid results. So the initial hypothesis that we had in the, in the batch three experiment was that the more specific the question, the better the output would be, or the more valid the output would be. But the um, outcome that we uh, that we got was that it was the entire opposite. The um, risk scores for vague questions in the risk scores um, index, they had the highest amount of uh, valid results, which was the um, which is not the hypothesis that we had initially. So that was a surprise. And this is um, only for the SQL coder um, results. So if you look at it, uh, the most amount of um, valid results were in the number station uh, were in the number station tests. So it was able to uh, it was able to find valid results for specific, vague and very specific questions across all three all three or six of the indexes. And data ease was on the second. It was only able to find a few of vague questions in the cyber eye metrics, but um, the risk scores default index yielded the most amount of uh, valid results. So for as across all of them, the number station model had the highest amount of um, valid results. So for the demo, unfortunately, the API endpoint is uh, shut down. So I'm not able to run the notebook that I had, but I have a few uh, screenshots for how the output looked. Okay, this so, gives some context. Yeah. We were using quite big models and we couldn't run them on the laptop. We were running them on Databricks, but Databricks incurs a cost. So we thought we can save costs by hitting the open free endpoint and it just so happens it's down for maintenance today. So we went and yeah. got some screenshots as a backup, which is always a good option. Uh, and yeah, now they've got them up now. Yeah, so the question here was uh, how many metrics have surpassed the threshold in the last quarter? And when you when the query is run, the result is 176. So 176 metrics and just results with it just parses out all the um, brackets and commas and gives you the straight result. And this is another one where uh, we just, so for all the questions that result in a numerical answer, the response is fairly accurate. But when we parse in another LLM like a GPT-2 or a BERT, it requires a little bit of fine tuning before it results in a um, natural language response with the numerical value the the LLM result was we were trying to put in another AI to kind of morph the answer into something more chat body and that was what we tried to do on Tuesday so we didn't have a lot of time to make it real good so all it did was remove the the special characters and give us the result yeah. so for the same the same question that you ask do you always get the same result yes always always if it's the same um it is the same like instantiation of the model. So yeah, yeah. You, get, you get the same result every time. Yeah. And it is a good point to have robustness testing where you give it 50 different versions of the same question, see if it gets the same result. So in your ML ops, if you were to go, hey, how do we know that the new model we put into this system is good? That would be part of your automated testing. You probably have some suite of questions and then buzz those questions and see what happens. And then my other question was, did you, did you fuzz the data, um, the actual test data, for different variations to see what the queries would do? 
No, I don't think so. Yeah. Did you ever get back information that is sensitive and not relevant to the query? Um, no, I think most of the questions, if it's fairly big, it just gives an empty output. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get any like um, sensitive data. Yeah, so nothing was returned that you weren't expecting? No. I'd say some of the responses were maybe close, but not exact. There's a few that would <coughs> ask more for an aggregate, but it might give you a list. And it depends on the complexity of the query as well. <laughs> and I think that wasn't in the scope, but this is a good use case where you have a different use of access rights with different access control on the data yeah. and see whether you can. I know it was not in the scope, but that's a good use case. Mm. And that's uh, Databricks one, like House IQ has that, where it's built on their Unity catalog, which has its own innate access control, and then they've integrated that with their chatbot thing. So yeah, there's those yeah. considerations as well. If you're going to build it into a system, so you could you could integrate um, something towards the end of the chain to say, hey, just before you send it on, has this user got permission? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it would be part of your your request. You'd be yeah. like query user, everything like that, and then your own access control and all the it if yep. or you, or the LLM would know and say that. Yeah, yeah. that's a question I can answer. So you would you. Is that like just a configuration or is that a training that's been done as uh, to what's that'd be outside of I think the model? As in like with that initial diagram and I was talking about there's different models in different places and the data's going between them and you'd have one part that's responsible for access control mm -hmm. and it may be across your entire system, so even from direct query, and then you just integrate the the chatbot for that so that it gets blocked for the others. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the crowd? <coughs> we do have a couple of um, extra slides just on next steps and learnings. Okay. Um, the, so of the 60 questions that we tested the model on, close to like uh, five to six of the, five to ten of them stood out in their ability to be um, queried properly across every single one of the indexes. And um, the successful questions were surprisingly vague and also they were they involved a lot of uh, quantitative data. And the, the highlighted to us that the accuracy is contingent on the completeness of the schema that you parse into the context and also the components of the training data. So for um, number station SQL, the training data was fairly similar to the way we had parsed in the um, cyber data in our local um, database. That's I think that's why it worked that well. And another thing to add here is the parametric configuration. So I think David, I asked the question about like if we ask the same question again, will, do we get the same results? If we if we tinker with the parameters after like it's already run, we do get like different results. But depends on how you tinker with the parameters, the some of the results are more accurate or less accurate. So why do you think this is the case? Why the vague questions are? Yeah. Do Do you have any opinion? Um, I know it, with the machine it's hard to tell why, but yeah. any opinion? I, I I think it's because the um, Compared to the previous batches of testing, we had a new set of questions specifically for the risk scores um, index. Mm -hmm. And for risk scores, because most of the answers are quantitative, so I think no matter what question you ask, it is even because the questions are fairly specific, even the vague ones are somewhat specific in um, referring to at least one of the fields. That's why it retrieves some data. So some of the questions, um, it just retrieves the entire table. Mm. It retrieves the entire risk scores default table that we've um, obtained, right? So I think it's more that the index is uh, quantitative. That's why you can ask it big questions and it'll just result in okay. a fairly. Okay. So maybe if we have text in the tables, maybe the more specific questions will retain better results. Maybe. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Accurate and fit the purpose. NLP query to answer systems would require a lot of components like access control, even guardrails around, oh, you, that answer looks really bad, don't even show it to the user kind of thing, or, or providing users more context so they can understand the answer. And then different solution patterns may prove valuable. So while we were doing this, we were looking at people's different blogs and, and posts about what people are doing, and there's other ways you can query elastic data. So 
and to maybe even answer one of Lakshmi's questions where he said, have we tried training an existing model to answer cyber specific questions? Instead of trying to generate a query, you could just encode um, the entire index into a database and then train a model on that, which would be a different way of kind of trying to do that, but then you'd have to retrain it to keep it live. Or there's other ways where you can store all your documents as a vector and then use it, a user model to retrieve a document that might answer a certain question based on similarity, then give that document to a large language model and say, hey, can you answer this question with this document? So the document might be Sabud's last doctor login and your question was when did Sabud last login? And it goes, oh, this should answer the question and then it can kind of feed it back. So that goes to maybe there's different patterns that would fulfill different questions. So what we were looking at was something that eventually you would use for massive aggregations or complex questions where you'd need to query a lot of documents. Whereas then for something that only needs a single document, maybe that other pattern would be would be good. And then also the, the cost on compute training because good AP, uh, but like open AI and everything, their endpoints get quite expensive if you link a production system to them and even dev systems. And also hosting and training your own models is quite expensive if you're doing a lot of data like Elastic. So there's considerations around that. And um, yeah, we can't just go, yeah, we'll, we'll train our own model and it'll be easy and take quite a bit. Uh, and based off that, we had some notes on next steps for the project and anyone else who uh, comes along next. So next slide, uh, which was consolidate the learnings with the existing cyber solution engineers and then we can even incorporate more indexes into the scope and inject it with the live data with the current pattern and also tune and build additional components with the current pattern. Then, as mentioned, we could also explore different patterns to either answer different questions or, or whether they're more effective at certain things. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. Um, so Lakshmi's other question is, how is the model doing in terms of mapping business terminology to field names? Businesses usually don't have any idea about the field names and physical model. Yeah, that was one of the drivers for the vague yeah. first specific questions. So one of the things in specificity was giving exact field names and table names. And as we saw, the vague questions did all right on some yeah. indexes, so it did pretty well. And also one more thing on the on the incorporating more indexes part. Cyber only has like uh, maximum is I think 330 indexes. And each of them, each of the indexes, they have their own fields and you know st uh, JSON structure format. So if every single one of them is turned into a SQL table and parsed in and into like a large language model as a context with all the um, with all the comments and stuff that describes every single one of the fields within these indexes, I mean, 329 indexes, it's not not a lot. I mean, it, mm -hmm. for it'll take like months and stuff to. Um, comment every, what every single field does, but 329, if it's 16,000 or something, that's a lot, but 329 is still a visualizable number. So if that entire, um, all the indexes are parsed in as a context, you could find a way to do the text to SQL for every single one of the questions within the cyber right. So to your point, those learnings that we had here, how can they help us improve that C, uh, text to SQL in Tableau or BI. Do we know now how we train the models, how we tune the model? Yeah, there's so in the inbuilt ones, I don't know if you, you can't really, I, you might be able to train them extra on your context, depends on how they're set up, but it's also around the metadata you give them. So if you just say, here's my table and have some garbage table uh, column names, it might not do so well, but if you give it explicit and well-defined and even comments and things on your table, it might use those as well to give better results. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen ones where it kind of gives almost prompts like, oh, by the way, this is the join key between these two tables, if it isn't obvious or things like that mm -hmm. that help it go, oh, okay, I need to join those. So, yes, there's new models every, every month being dropped on Hugging Face. Mm -hmm. yeah. Overall, and also kudos to May. It was a tough, mm. tough project, and 
I sort of said, yeah, this is what we're going to try and do and see how you go. And he did really well considering also the first first skill food internship presentation, which was also a big learning. Um, he's done a couple other showcase presentations before where he's learned a lot about presenting technical things to a business rather than, you know, your lecturer or your professor or your, your peers. And so, yeah, he's done really well. And I'd just like to thank him for being a part of this. So. And, and thanks, Darcy, for all the support. I couldn't have done this without you. Yeah. I think well done, well done, everyone. If you think about it, two days for six weeks, and I wrote it down here, it's a total of 12 total working days. Like this is amazing, right? This is exactly what how we should be able to test new ideas, learn about them, have those learnings, take them, appreciate the outcomes with it. Thanks, Darcy. Thanks, MA. Thanks, Maddie as well, yeah. and everyone who was really involved in this, in this, uh, in this work. So thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate. It. Again, a round of applause, guys. Thank you, and MA. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Thanks.